Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's lecture. I'm Deb Sahadi, your teaching director. Let's jump in. Let's open in a word of prayer. Oh, Father God, thank you so much for preserving your word. And thank you for these lessons to warn us about all the false and wrong teachings in this world. We pray for open eyes and ears and hearts to know you, the truth, to seek you, the truth, to trust you, the truth. Father God, we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Shadows are made by blocking light. Light is the electromagnetic radiation of energy comprised of photon particles which travel in packets at a frequency our human eyes can detect. An opaque object that lies in the path of the light blocks the light rays and a shadow is formed. There are three things required to make a shadow, light, an opaque object, and a surface on which the shadow is formed. Now, all shadows share common characteristics. First, they're always erect, meaning they're always same side up as the object. Second, they have no color, they're always black. Third, they can be smaller, equal to, or larger in size than the object. Fourth, the shadow is always on the opposite side of the light source. And fifth, shadows are real, albeit representations of the source. They are real if we define real as we can see them. Okay, but here's where it gets tricky. Shadows are real in the sense that they can be seen. But can they? I mean, what are we seeing when we see a shadow? We're not seeing the object. What we're really seeing is the absence of light. We're seeing around the path blocking the light, which is only produced when a light source passes around the object. Remove the object and there's no shadow. Remove the light and there's no shadow. Shadows are the absence of photon port particles. So we're not seeing anything actually when we see a shadow. Now, does this hurt your head? Well, just wait. Now consider this. Radio waves, which are energized photon particles moving at a frequency our human eyes cannot see, they are outside of the visible spectrum of human sight. They are very real, but invisible. So, track with me here. We have shadows, which are nothing, that are visible, and we have radio waves, which are something, that are invisible. It's these physical realities, these rudimentary principles of our world that actually help us understand today's passage, which is about shadows and substance. We pick up in our reading following chapter 1 of Colossians, where the source of light is revealed and the substance in particular splendor. In verses 19 and 20, which says, For in him, talking about Jesus, <clears throat> For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. For those of us who accept God's grace of reconciliation, we receive God's shining light, and we pray the blessing of Numbers 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. May all turn to God and be saved and accept God's face turned upon us in love and mercy, given for life and salvation. So we pick up in verse 8, following Paul and Timothy's plea for born-again believers to continue to remain fast in Christ Jesus, in whom is the fullness of God, who brought complete reconciliation, redemption, and peace, shalom. They also warned against false teachers and heresy that divert believers away from Christ. The warnings continue in our passage and in our world today. 
we'll follow the text and find there are four primary empty shadows that are wrong, they're false. These are Gnosticism, Legalism, Mysticism, and Asceticism. All these religions, philosophies, principles, beliefs, practices, doctrines, ideals are false. False because they don't claim the truth and reality and sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Not only do they not claim them, they deny them. And furthermore, they're wrong because they divert people from the truth, the reality, and sufficiency of God the Father and God the Son, who by their good grace give us everlasting life. In each one of these false teachings, doctrines, and systems, these distorted shadows, we'll discover that the substance is in Jesus the Christ, Son of God. The problem with believing in a shadow is that the shadow isn't the substance. Only the substance is real and true and life-giving. Please follow along in your Bibles as we traverse these dangers, which existed long ago and still plague humanity at an alarming rate. The first is Gnosticism. Now, the basic tenet of Gnostics is that physical matter is evil, the spiritual is divine. Gnosticism is wrong primarily because it denies the deity of Jesus Christ. Gnostics argue that God would never reside in evil matter, the human body, or they say that Jesus was not really human, he merely had the appearance of a human. They deny that Jesus is fully God and fully man. There are actually four major Gnostic religions around the world today. Uh, the biggest sect is the Ecclesia Gnostica, the Gnostic Church, which is built on the belief started in 180 AD and was significantly influenced by the ideology of Carl Jung in the 1900s, who focused on the process of reuniting with the divine aspect of the self. He taught that we humans have a collective unconscious, and it's by making use of their collective consciousness that we can give meaning to the world. Gnosticism continues to morph based on new enlightenment and cultural shifts. These cults are primarily dangerous because they mix esoteric ideas with a smattering of Christianity, and so appeal by deception to a broader audience, actually claiming to be a Christian religion. They combine several parts of the Catholic Bible containing the 14 books that were later removed with their own fragments of discovered insight, including the epileptic from Adam, yes, Adam, the original Adam, and from Noah's son, Shem, who have a different version of creation and salvation. Their lectionary also includes teaching from other people claiming to be spiritual apostles of Jesus. They combine mythology and other related writings, uh, such as the Hermetic from the occult, the Mandean holding a dual view of life, and the Cather scriptures promoting the belief that the material world is evil, as well as the Chaldean oracles. Remember the Chaldeans of Babylon and their false gods? You can read all about this at their website, gnosis.org. The Gnostics archive are also contained in their Nag Hammadi library, discovered in Egypt in 1945, completely revised in 2005, and now widely available, even on Amazon, for example, as are hundreds of books on Gnosticism. They hold weekly mass in churches with all the finery of vestments and traditional sacraments and liturgy. The category of Gnosticism has also been adopted by other scholars to frame several revolutionary phenomena, including Nazism and Jihadism, and is included in the occult. By removing the deity of Jesus Christ, Gnostics have removed everything Christian and, and completely corrupted God's word, especially his son. Here, here's an example. Suppose you pick up a newspaper and find a small piece has been ripped out. Hey, it's only a little bit. I know, in the absence of fact, they say, let's fill in the headline. This is important. 
It's an invasion after all, and we have most of the word. It begins with the letter A and ends in S. There, aliens pouring into northern France. This is essentially what most false religions do. The best lies are based on truth. The truth here we know is that aliens did not invade northern France. Yes, we know it was the Allies in World War II. The Allies invaded northern France on D-Day in 1944 to liberate Europe and defeat Germany. What a difference! In reality today, we are being invaded, not by aliens. Well, that'll probably be the next wave of deceit to grip humanity. Mankind is currently being invaded by the deceptive and empty philosophies cropping up around the globe. True Christian philosophy takes captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ, as 2 Corinthians 2.5 tells us. Philosophy is the love of wisdom, but if the wisdom is not of Christ Jesus, the love is of deceiving, empty thinking, because Christ is the sum of all wisdom, according to Colossians 2.3. The Gnostic philosophy is a hollow, worldly wisdom, conglomerated, fabricated, self-created, and imposed, deceptive, cunning, sensuous, removing parts of the truth that don't fit the paradigm of human ingenuity, self-sufficient enlightenment. It's, it's a doit idolatry, filling in the blanks according to human tradition, tradition not based on Jesus but on man-made rites, rituals, sacraments, practices, and fluffy traditions, neither commanded by Jesus nor honoring to Jesus. I mean, this was also a big problem in Jesus' day, and he reprimanded the Pharisees, as in Mark 7.13, saying their imposed traditions may, quote, void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. It's a dangerous thing to make void the word of God, to trump his word with human convention of human ideology. All these false and wrong ideas are based on the elemental spirits of the world. And the term elemental spirits is a term we don't use or hear very often. But the biggest clue that it means something wrong and false is that they are of the world. They are not from above. They are not from God above. James 1.17 tells us only the good stuff comes from God, saying, quote, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change, end quote. There is no shadow with God because he is the immutable fixed light source who is pleased to dwell in the fullness of of his deity in Christ Jesus. There is no fullness, no substance in vain human reasoning. The fullness is only in Christ. Apart from him is nothingness. The essence of God is in his Son, is his Son. The Word was with God, was God, who always was, pre-existing from eternity past, and came as a human a real, alive human in human flesh and blood to dwell among us here on earth. The Gnostics, along with many people today, deny that Jesus is fully God and fully human. Some do acknowledge that Jesus was born and walked the earth, but they reduce him to a prophet or a good man, stripping him of all his deity, ripping out the truth, distorting or ignoring altogether his cross. They recognize his birth and life, but not his death on the cross in payment for our sins. For the world, word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God, according to 1 Corinthians 1.18. And it's, the, it's by the power of God that Christ Jesus is head over every power and authority. In his death and resurrection, Jesus triumphed over every power and authority, including the demonic elemental spirits of the world. This is who Jesus is, fully God, fully human, head over every power and authority. He's the real deal, because the substance is in Jesus Christ, and in him all things hold together, all things exist. 
This is the reality. This is the unchanging true and real truth. And we born-again believers must live according to the word, not according to the world, lest we be deceived and taken captive. We are warned not to be taken captive, made a victim by fraud or spoiled, as some translations put it. Legalism is the next area Paul and Timothy address. Jewish legalism in their day taught that circumcision and obedience to the law was necessary for salvation. Acts 15 details the problem. Gnostic legalism taught that the Jewish law would help people become more spiritual. If they were circumcised and if they watched their diets and if they observed the holy days, then they would be elevated to the spiritual elite. And this same thinking exists today. But legalism is wrong because it denies the reality of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done. It denies Christ's sufficiency for our spiritual needs. It puts the emphasis on the form rather than the substance, making the shadows bigger than the object. Legalism attempts to usurp the object, and in this case, the law. But it's dark and distorted, and when the shadows are bigger than the object, the focus is on the shadows, and the object is lost. The first example of legalism is circumcision, which was a sign of God's covenant with his chosen people Israel, according to Genesis 17, 9-14. It was an outward physical operation with spiritual significance. The problem was, and still is today, that people depend on the physical ceremony to bring spiritual grace. God warned his people, and this goes for us today, all the way back in Deuteronomy 10:16, he says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no longer stubborn. This is the spirit of the law, not the letter. And in Christ Jesus, on this side of the cross, we experience a spiritual circumcision through Jesus, putting off the flesh, the sin, decisively put off by Christ's atoning sacrificial death once for all. This putting off of our old sinful life occurs at the moment of our salvation, when believers are buried with Christ in baptism by the Holy Spirit and raised with him to a new life. Water baptism is a physical picture of what actually happens. Immersion portrays burial with Christ coming up out of the water, portrays the resurrection by the power of God. It's not the rite of water baptism that it's performed by a sinful human that brings salvation. Our salvation is through faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone. I mean, how can a sinful human perform a legalistic physical ritual, especially on an infant, and give salvation? This denies the reality of Christ Jesus, and it abrogates the purpose of the law, which is to show us our sin. The law cannot protect the violator, and we have all sinned. The law has no power to justify it. Legalistic rites and ceremonies have no power to save us. Romans 3.20 puts it succinctly, saying, for by, God's, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, God's sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. It's the knowledge of our sin that humbles us to accept God's forgiveness through faith in his Son. It's by accepting God's grace, accepting Jesus' payment for our sin, that we are saved. We all have a record of debt, but God, in his gracious love, canceled our record of debt. And it's not that he merely made it go away. It's that Jesus took on our sin and paid the death penalty in our place. God canceled our debt with all the legal demands against us. Most people narrow the scope of God's law to the Ten Commandments, but there are actually 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Galatians 3.10 tells us everyone is cursed who does not do everything written in the law, quoting Deuteronomy 27.26. In Galatians 3.19, we learn that the law was added because of mankind's sin until the arrival of the promised Messiah, Jesus. And Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, 
according to Matthew 5.17. In his perfect sacrificial death on the cross, God in actual fact nailed our debt to the cross with Jesus, showing our debt is paid in full. Not by human means, but by God's just power and grace in his Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the substance, the reality, not a shadow. And in canceling our debt, he disarmed the demonic powers and authorities, triumphing over them. And we born-again believers are delivered from the evil powers, which inspire legalistic rights, which keep people tethered to the legalities and demands of the law, which also includes simple things like what to eat and drink and what and how to observe festivals, etc., etc., etc. For those of us who accept Jesus, we are free from sin, free to live in Christ Jesus, because God canceled our record of debt with its legal demands against us by nailing it to the cross of Jesus. Now, in response, we obey the law in two overarching ways, as Jesus tells us in Matthew 22, 30. 7 to 40. He says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. These are the two greatest moral precepts of God's law. This is the foundation of true religion our relationship with God and with other members of Jesus's body, the church. And if we love Jesus, we follow his commands. It's from our stance in Jesus, in our membership in his body, with Jesus as the head, that we are next warned about mysticism. Simply put, mysticism is wrong because it denies the headship of Jesus Christ, his headship over the body of born-again believers, his church. Those who turn believers from the reality in Christ and, and position of Christ, turning them to the shadow of the law and esoteric mysticism, they rob believers of their spiritual rewards. These are the heretics with false humility, turning believers away from faithful service. They imitate a form of godliness, but deny its power, according to 2 Timothy 3, 5, which also instructs us to avoid these people. This artificial godliness of legalists and mystics practiced and promoted, along with other things, angel worship, which scripture clearly forbids. Uh, for example, in Exodus 20 and Revelation 22. In fact, we can trace the activities of fallen angels setting themselves up as false gods in the Old Testament, that were so prevalent in Egyptian, Roman, and Greek religions, which are actually making a comeback in our time. Modern paganism or neo-paganism includes reconstructed religions such as Roman polytheistic reconstructionism, Hellenism, Slavic native faith, Celtic reconstructionist paganism, or heathenry, as well as modern eclectic traditions such as Wicca and its many offshoots, neo druidism and Discordianism. And then there are the New Age religions, including belief in reincarnation, astrology, psychics, and the presence of spiritual energy and physical objects like mountains or trees. These various false religions are puffed up by vain visions, empty visions experienced by mystic mediations, which are idle notions, vain to no avail, as Galatians 3, 4 puts it. Far from being humble, such a person's unspiritual mind, meaning a mind of the flesh, is puffed up, inflated with pride in their visions. They believe their mysticism brings them into touch with some higher reality. Believers who fall into these snares have lost touch with Jesus, the head of the body, who alone supplies life and every spiritual need. Therefore, we're warned to hold fast to the head of the body of believers, the head, Jesus Christ. It's from him and only him that the whole body is nourished and knit together and grows, grows with a growth that's from God. 
True spirituality does not come by compliance with the law or any false religions, but by connection with the life, Jesus, who is the truth, who is the substance. Jesus Christ is the reality, and we born-again believers hold on to him as the head of our body, from whom we receive all necessary nourishment, knitting all believers together, growing in him with a growth from God. This is all we need. What are people to do today in the midst of so much deceiving clutter and false teachings and alluring snares? Seek the truth. The truth can be found. Isaiah 55, 6 pleads us to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Matthew 7, 7 tells us to seek and you shall find. And you know, wise men still seek him. And a word to the wise is sufficient before it's too late. Which brings us to the final category we're warned about, asceticism, which is usually accompanying legalism and mysticism and is included in assorted false religions and practices. Asceticism is a quasi-spiritualism that boasts in regulations of physical self-denial and or physical self-harm that are thought to heighten spirituality in the practitioner, thereby inducing resistance to sin. The Bible plainly tells us asceticism is wrong because it denies freedom in Christ. Asceticism tethers people, enslaves them to meaningless rules and regulations. It denies the freedom Christ Jesus has purchased for us, the freedom from, the, from sin by the power of truth. Those who claim religious freedom but are slaves to the letter are not free at all. And those who claim moral freedom but are slaves to sin are not free at all. The chains that bind the body cannot set free the spirit. Romans 8, 2 tells us, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Self-made religions of the world have the appearance of wisdom, but they're of no value. They appear to have lofty ideologies and superior practices and amazing rites and secret memberships in some cases, but there is no substance. It's all show. Like this image with the trees casting big shadows. But if you look at it closely, you see that the trees in the image are not the ones casting the shadows at all. The shadows are from trees not even visible. For the born again believer, we're instructed not to submit to human so called religious rules and regulations and rights which are grounded in the worldly systems of the flesh. We are in Christ, so we have died to the world and now live in him. Worldly human man-made religions have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh, the sin nature. These worldly systems have no substance. They have no power because the true substance is in Jesus Christ. He is the truth, the only truth that has the power over sin and death to set us free. We don't need to submit to hollow man-made stuff. They cannot remove sin. They only feed the self-pride. They do not change the heart. In a shadow, we actually only see around the shadow, minus the object. Shadows are blocked. Light is required to see color. And shadows are the absence of light. A surface is needed on which to cast the shadow. These are the fools accepting the shadow as reality, stumbling around in the dark. 1 Timothy 4, 1-3 says this, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars who consciousness are seared, who forbid marriage and require absence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Will we choose to follow the truth, the substance, who is Jesus Christ? 
please pray with me. Dear Father God, just thank you so much. Thank you so much for preserving this ancient text that um, just seems to illuminate so many of the false religions and false teachings and problems of our world today. And Father God, we are so thankful that the truth, the substance, is in your beautiful Son, Jesus Christ, and that you have a plan for us, and that for those of us who believe in you, we are your children, and for that we are forever, literally forever thankful. And Father God, we would pray that for those who are stumbling around in the dark, that we would be bold, that we would be able to carry your light into these dark places so that all can come to a saving faith in your beautiful Son, Jesus Christ. Father God, we love you. We thank you so much. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.